Good morning. It's good to be with you guys. God is good all the time. God is good. Yeah, it's like old school Nazarene right there. I'm only 28. My name is Trevor, and it is really good to be with you guys here in person. And for those of you online, uh, I'm excited to join us this morning. Dave is a great friend of mine and a good mentor. He has trained me along the way. And if you guys are saying, "Uh uh-oh, I know. But uh, I'm really excited to be here today. We're going to go through the path of God. You can turn or tap with me uh, to Proverbs chapter 3 is where we'll begin, and then we'll pick up in Matthew chapter 14. But before we go there, I wanted to just introduce myself a bit. My name is Trevor again, and I am a new co-pastor of a church plant here in the Phoenix uh, East Valley area. My wife, Rochelle, joins us as well this morning. She's a doctor of physical therapy at Phoenix Children's, and my son, Carson, is in the nursery, and he's really good at picking his nose. Um, So I think he learned that from his mom. It was was probably me. But I'm excited to share the word with you this morning. Before we get into it, uh, I have a story to tell you. I love stories, and specifically this one. When I was young, I was told this. And it it takes place many, many years ago, but there's this archaeologist. Uh, If you guys don't know what that is, it's somebody who goes into crazy countries, and sometimes even here in America, and they unearth uh, things that have been hidden for thousands, hundreds, maybe just a decade ago, right, with those time capsules we all planted. And so this archaeologist was a professor. Uh, He's a doctor, and he actually went forth, got through his studies, and after he had spent so many years in the field, he began to teach. And he was teaching and teaching, and it just wasn't enough for him. He had to take a a step of faith and kind of go out and continue his education. His father gave him this book that kind of explored this new dig, this site that hadn't been unearthed before. It's actually been hidden away for thousands of years. And this book had kind of like all the secrets he needed to to follow to get to that artifact. And so he spends quite a bit of time going through these obstacles and reading through the book. He opens it and his father's handwriting is saying, take this path, remember these things. It's dangerous, there's obstacles. And he finally gets to the path of God. And in the book, it kind of shows Jesus on the water You have to take this step of faith, this blind step of faith into the unknown. And there's a sense of urgency behind this doctor, this professor here, as he's trying to get to the next step. His anxiety is boiling up in his chest, and he doesn't know what to do. And so he climbs through this cavern, and he gets to the entrance of the path of God. And as he steps forth, he sees hundreds of feet below and hundreds of feet above to the right, to the left. There's no way across this cavern. He looks to the other side and he can see it. It's right there. Now he could go home, he could get a crew and they could build like this bridge, right? But no, he needed to do it now. There was urgency behind him and so he read the book, Step of Faith, kind of looks down, says a little holy cross and he lands on solid ground. He walks across, and he makes it, and he realizes that it was an optical illusion, that this this bridge was there the whole time. So he grabs some rocks and throws it. You guys probably know what I'm talking about now, right? Indiana Jones. When I was like eight or nine years old, this movie gave me so much anxiety. I'm sitting there watching Dr. Jones, and he's standing across the bridge. The reason there's urgency is because his father had just been shot. I think it was by the Nazis, right? The bad guys in the movie. And he needs to get the Holy Grail. Sometimes we find ourselves in that same position of the the cavern, death below, and it's just right there. I can almost touch it. I can almost see it, just like Indiana Jones, right? Let's jump into Scripture uh, before I go too much further into my nerdum there, all right? We're going to go to Proverbs chapter 3, starting at verse one. It'll be on the screen for you as well if you don't have a device or a Bible in front of you. It says this, my child, I'm reading from the New Living Translation as well, for those of you who, who need to know. My child, never forget the things that I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder and write them deep within your heart. And you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and do not depend on your own understanding. 
Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you the path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord your God and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing in your body and strength for your bones. Honor God with your wealth and with the best part of everything that you produce. And he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you for this space to worship freely, to read your word in public, and for this to be broadcasted around the world for people to see now and in the future. God, be with us today. Open our hearts and our minds to what you want to tell us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. This uh, proverb here is written by King Solomon. Solomon is probably one of the wisest men in the entire world, right? We, we look back and we can see this, this great king and ruler, and yeah, he did some bad stuff too. We're not going to go into that today, but as you read through, you, you see these things, and Solomon opens with this, my child, my son, my daughter. I think scripture transcends time, and so when I'm looking at this, I can see King Solomon speaking to me, Trevor. My child, never forget the things that I have taught you. This next part here, store my commands. See, Solomon's not actually talking about his commands. He's speaking about God's commands. He goes on to say these things. Be kind and loyal. Trust the Lord your God with all your heart, right? That's like the caravans verse. The kids' church verse that that we go over, we memorize and put it in our hearts. I'm pretty sure I have a ribbon on my wall back home at my parents' house for memorizing that one. Do not lean on your own understanding. It's interesting. Wisest man in the world here, who can probably lean on his own understanding, is telling us not to. Don't lean on your own understanding. Instead, trust in the Lord your God with all your heart. Seek him first, and he will show you the unseen path, the path of God. You know, I think back to Indiana Jones. It was probably the first time in my life that I had truly seen a leap of faith. At least it's the the one that always comes back to my mind as I think back in my 28, tomorrow, 29 years, Indiana Jones takes the biggest leap of faith that I have ever seen. And I know it's fake, right? I know it's not a true story, but you can see the compassion in his heart for his father, who he loves so much, and how he's willing to die, to step out into the unknown for his dad. And it's not for the artifact. At that point, it's no longer for the Holy Grail, right? It's because he wants to save His father, he does not trust in his own understanding, right? Turns to that little book that his father gave him. He says to trust God and to take the leap of faith. So I've uh, I've taken a leap of faith this year. Actually, it's been a two-year journey. My wife and I are planting a church. That's crazy, right? I have this important mentor in my life, Dr. Mark Bain, and Mark tells me, uh, if you don't believe in church planning, then you should go to church in Jerusalem every Sunday, because every church after it is a church plant. That gives me courage. (laughs) But honestly, I cannot trust on my own understanding. 2019, January, I'm uh, sitting in church and just kind of feeling led to start a conversation. So I asked Pastor Doug, our district superintendent, who uh, is like the pastor of pastors here in Arizona. I said, Doug, I'd just like, love to grab coffee or lunch with you and just talk what it looks like to plant a church. Says in you know, his Oklahoma accent, sure thing. A couple months later, we are just invited to join Doug and so many other couples at this church planners conference. So my wife and I, we go with a two-week-old baby. Carson was just born shortly after this, and we show up to this Church Planners Conference. It's 36 intense hours where we got no sleep, right? Absolutely none. Because we worked until 11 p.m. And then Carson did not sleep that night. I did. Sorry, Rochelle. 
But through that weekend, we experienced so many different things and learned what it looked like to plant a church in 2019, pre-pandemic. The General Church of the Nazarene gave us a little stamp of approval and said, if you planted a church tomorrow, we would support you. Holy cow. What? I don't, know. I don't even know what it looks like to plant a church. I don't even know if I want to plant a church. I'm just here because I asked Doug about it in January. Three months go by, and me and my good friend Ryan, who's actually now my co-pastor, we meet up at Panera Bread, like we, we always do. I always say it, hoping that Panera would like sponsor me or something, give me free like bread bowls, anything. I love that place. And we're talking ministry, we're talking youth, and we're talking about the next year and how we're going to plan it. And then he goes, what about church planning? What's your thoughts about that, Trevor? I began to speak about intentional communities, houses, innovating, and he echoes every single one of those. Intentional communities, house churches, innovating. I mean, it was like that freeze frame moment in the sitcom, right? Are we on the same page here? Did we, be just, did we just become best friends? We were already really great friends up to that point, but God had already laid the foundations of everything before we had ever even knew it. Before we even showed up to that Panera Bread, God was already working in the life of Ryan and Megan and myself and Rochelle. And at that point in 2019, August, we decided to plant a church. We don't know what that looks like still. <laughs> Two years in, we're still making it up as we go. But in January, we began to meet with our core team, and we, we began to launch forth this church, this idea of what we wanted church to look like. And we got three months in, and everything stopped, right? 2020, pandemic, this crazy year. At that first moment, I said, okay, we can just stop. I can just like, do church as I know it. Let's get through this. Let's love people. Let's stay safe and healthy. Thank you all for wearing a mask today. I appreciate that. But no. God said, go. Take the unseen path, Trevor. That was the first time that I uh, began to keep my, take my eyes off Jesus, and he rescued me. We go through this pandemic, and God is saying so many things to my wife and I, and Late nights of talking and lamenting and frustrated because, God, there's a, there's a global pandemic. We can't meet together. We can't do anything. I'm trying to figure out this online thing. I feel like an inadequate pastor. Like nothing is going right. And you want me to plant a church in the midst of this? And he says, Trevor, take another step. Trust me. And so I took this security and this paycheck and everything that I understood about church, and I left it behind. December 31st, I left Tempe Nazarene Church as their youth pastor to go forth into the unknown. To be 100% committed to God and His unseen path. For the last three months, I have been unemployed. For the last three months, it's, it's been like kind of nice to Take a sabbatical to rest. But as the days and weeks were ticking by, Rochelle and I, we would call PenFed, our, one of our loan providers, and say, hey, husband's out of work. We can't pay our loan this month. And thank God for the pandemic. Because they said, we understand. There's a global pandemic. You're going to be forgiven. Don't worry about it. No penalty here. Tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., I'll step foot into my new job. For the first time in three months, I will have a job. I'll be a police dispatcher at Gilbert PD. It's going to be crazy, I know. Pray for me. <laughs> but God has provided time and time and time again. My son never went hungry, never missed a meal. In fact, he just started swim lessons yesterday. Because God has provided. We never missed a mortgage. We never missed a bill. No, we didn't go to go on date nights for a while, but I took Rochelle on a date two weeks ago for the first time in three months. Six months. Nine months. Okay. It was a pandemic, babe. But God has always provided, and God will always provide for those he calls. And guess what? We are all called. 
It is not just me or Pastor Dave or Pastor Josh or Pastor Dan. My previous senior pastor, John, just around the corner preaching a probably great message as well. It's not just us. It is you. What is God calling you to do to take that step on the unseen path? I don't have a point today, but if I did, it would be trust God, right? Write that down. Put it in your phone. You guys know, right? To trust God. That reminds me of another story. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22. that will be on the screens as well. <clears throat> Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. To preface this, Jesus uh, just fed 5,000 men and probably a bunch more women and children, right? He takes five loaves and two fish. There's like that song, five loaves and two fish. Jesus made a wonderful dish. I'm like really Nazarene, guys, okay? My mom's a children's pastor. And so he, he's sending the people home, and he's telling his disciples to go across the lake. This is 2,000 years ago. There's not Uber. There's not some boat service that Jesus can probably just call up in the middle of the night and say, hey, take me to those guys out there. In fact, on this water... In these trepid seas, these, this, the water gets crazy in the evening, in the late, the late morning. The winds continue to blow down the, the, the mountainside and to rock any boat that might be on the water. And so he tells his disciples to go across to the other side of the lake, knowing full well what's coming. And some of his disciples are fishermen who also know full well what is coming. But they trust God and they say, okay, we'll go. You'll meet us there. I don't know how, but you will. So Jesus goes up onto the mountainside. We'll pick up here at verse 24. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land, for strong winds had risen, and they were fighting the heavy waves. About three in the morning, or the fourth watch, Jesus came towards them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! I've been uh, kind of watching the Pirates of the Caribbean a lot which is like a, you know, big boat scene from Disney, and there's like this crazy, scary boat. Like, these disciples who were fishermen probably heard the ghost stories, right? And so they're seeing this person walk on the water where the waves are crashing, the wind is blowing, and their first response is in terror. It's a ghost! And Jesus spoke to them, Do not be afraid. Take courage. I am here. You can actually look back to Exodus Chapter 3, the I am is here. The Lord, your God, is here. Then Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, and actually he's probably yelling here, so I'm not going to yell because i got a mic, but Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come out onto the water and to walk. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and began to walk on the water towards Jesus. If that ain't a step of faith, I don't know what is, right? But when he saw the strong winds and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. I've been there. Three times this year I was there. Take that step out in the boat. So I'm doing it. Planning church. We're doing it. Oh, man, it's so crazy. I'm sinking. Lord God, save me. I walk on the water again. A couple steps. Then I see the waves. Lord God, save me. And again, after twice, God has brought me out of my fear, anxiety. I take those steps. I quit my job. Lord, save me. Jesus immediately, without hesitation, reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And when they climbed back into the boat, the winds stopped. And the disciples worshipped him and said, You really are the Son of God. I feel like Peter in this, this story. I'm actually probably like a way worse version of Peter. 
January 2019, I think I called out to God, I'm going to step out of that boat. If it's you, tell me. If you, do, if you tell me, I'll do it. I stepped out with those first steps. I walked. It was great. And then like, oh, you really want me to plant a church? Sink. Lord, help me. He grabs me immediately. There's no hesitation. There's nothing. Immediately, as soon as I called out to Christ, I felt the comfort of the Lord around me. So I walked again. Cool, cool. We're doing it, Lord. What, you want me to, like, quit my job? Like, this is what provides income for my family, Lord. You understand, I got to feed my kids. I got to pay my bills. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to take my wife on a date. It's been too long. Step out of the boat, Trevor. Take those steps. Okay. I walk. January goes by. I've applied for 70 jobs, God. I'm trusting you, but come on. February. This is crazy, Lord. What are you doing? God said, do you trust me? You of little faith, do you trust me? So August of 2021, in the middle of a pandemic, still, we are planting the table, a house church network. And it is crazy. It makes no sense. If I think back to my own understanding, why? Why? And I think the path of God, it is not straight, right? There's twisty and rough. There's hills to climb. There's valleys to trudge through. But the path of God it's the path I want to be on. I think back to Indiana Jones, right? He cared so much about saving his father that he was willing to step out into literally death to do so. And Peter, to step out into the boat knowing that that water was cold and deep. But he stepped out into the boat. And so you today... On March 21st, 2021, what is God calling you to do? What's the step of faith that you need to take? I mentioned these really, really big ones, right? Indiana Jones, Peter, planting a church. What if it is merely to take Jesus seriously? When he says, to love your neighbor as yourself, he literally means your next door neighbor. You see, with the table, our goal is not to build up a grand building for God, to, to create this show for God. And again, hear me out. I love this. I love church. I love this moment. Thank you, Josh, for having me. Thanks to Dan for having me. Thank you, Dave, if you're listening to this now or tomorrow, for having me. Don't get me wrong. I love church. I'm not planning a church because of any animosity or frustration, but because I want to see the church succeed. And I want to see the church grow. And when I come and I die, and my son has children and his children have children, I want to see the church continue. And so God is calling me to do something crazy and to innovate and to literally love my neighbor, Emma, Jenna, as myself. So what is God telling you to do? Maybe you've been running from it, right? You're like, mm, 18 years old, I was at camp, and God said, hey, you're going to be a pastor, and, and now I'm 42, and I'm an accountant. What does it look like for you to take that step of faith? It might be just as small as turning to the people in these chairs. I was going to say pews, but you guys don't have those anymore. And saying, I love you, and I want to hear your story. Let's go to lunch care about you because you are my brother or sister in Christ. Lord God, push us, pull us, stretch us into doing your will. Make that path so clear that we literally can't do anything but take that next step. Remove any fear or anxiety. 
remove us from the equation. Take away my pride, my ego, what I think is best in my wisdom and replace it with you. For everyone here and watching online and watching in the future, Lord God, move now, I ask you. And help us to take that next step. In your name we pray. Amen.